I'm terrified. As many years as I have taught Bible study, led Bible study, been with ladies, talked about God, hopefully lived for God, I am terrified. And I think it's because when I started studying this month ago, six weeks, whatever it was, God just opened it up. And and I told Casey a little while ago, it, it brought me to tears. This book that we have read over and over and over, and I knew what it said so well. And then I get up and go to teach on it, and I go, June, you just were reading words. You know, I'm like um, Jill's little boy going to school. I, I just want to get it done. I feel like that's what I've done all my life. I don't want to just do that anymore. I want to get underneath it. That's why I teach. It's because I learn more than y'all do every single time. I also wanted to teach the first two lessons because I wanted to do the introduction. I love introductions. I love picking up a book and figuring out not only who wrote it, but why did he write it? And when did he write it? And to whom did he write it? And what was going on in his life when he wrote it? You know, that's the kind of stuff I love. That's the kind of stuff that brings me back into the book, whatever book I'm, I'm trying to study. And this time, um, I got blown away real quick because I kept, I had all my commentaries laid out and all my men I was getting ready to study and all my sermons I was going to listen to. And I kept hearing this word, consensus, consensus. And I went, now, Lord, <laughs> that is not where I wanted to go. I didn't want to hear the word consensus. Um, so this is what people think. We don't know for sure all this, all the things that are behind First John. Um, it is a general consensus now that John wrote the book. And I, now that's the one thing I'll differ with you on. I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that John wrote this book. I just don't think there's any doubt. But did I hear June? It's consensus, but John wrote this book. He wrote this book, they think, near the very end of the first century. You know, 80 to 95 A.D., that's a long span right there, but somewhere in 80 to 95, um, he wrote this book, and he wrote it, they think, from, the, from, from Ephesus. Could have been from other places, but they think it was written for Ephesus, written to the Christians that were in Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. Um, and he's writing, he's written five books, and all five of them are just amazing. He wrote John. John looks back at the birth and the and the death and the resurrection of Christ. And then he wrote 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, which by the way, the consensus is those are letters. <laughs> there's no greeting, there's no closing, but because of the content, they think these are letters. More power to them. It doesn't matter what they are to me. But anyway, he wrote these three books. They concerned the present time, both his present and our present. And they are teaching um, how we're supposed to be living today and his believers, how they were supposed to be living in their day. And then he writes Revelation, um, which is going to show us how God fulfills everything in history um, with the return of Jesus to, to earth and how he, he consummates everything he's done. That's Revelation. So we're in today. We're going to read the present. He writes to believers. And, and if you've got any notes, if I happen to say those words, circle those words. It's important to remember. This morning, I picked up my handy-dandy pencil and I went to doing this. Because I really didn't want to stay here till 2 o'clock. So I, all week long, every time I've gone through this, I have picked up my pencil and Oh, maybe I can get away with not saying that, maybe. And I'd cross it out. This morning, it was a little different. It wasn't to cut the time so much as, God, I want, I want this to be make as much sense to them as it's finally beginning to make to me. And I have to keep coming back to the word believers. He's writing to believers. If you're not really careful, by the time you even finish the first chapter 
um, you're feeling terrible about yourself and, and terrible about believers. And you got to remember, he's writing to believers. He's trying to tell you, don't be like the heretics. Don't be like them. You remember you are a believer. So he's writing to them. Um, in that t period of time, and I was going to say, you know, I don't know how it's different from today. He is writing, he's calling these, these people, these that have begun to infiltrate the church. He calls them liars, deceivers, false prophets. He even calls them antichrists in this book. He's, he's, he's not on board with everybody that's trying to tear up his believers in his church and to make them leave. The believers, I mean the non-believers, the, the heretics have been enlightened with some something. And they are leaving his church because they are so enlightened. They want to get away from y'all people. And they're taking people with them. And he's wanting to say, no, they're, they're non-believers. They are false. You stay here. You stay strong. I'm going to show you how to stay strong. And he gets right into it, showing us how we stay strong. This book will bring you to your knees when it finally opens up to you and it makes sense to you. It, it will open up. But anyway, um, he's, he's dealing with these people that they deny Christ. You know, they, they denied the existence of sin. You know, and I thought, how can anybody do that? But the more you, the more you get to thinking about it, the easier it is. We deny our sins sometimes. Um, they're not demonstrating Christian love. The Gnostics, especially, they were arrogant. They thought they had the, the secret, and they weren't going to give it to everybody, and they weren't sharing love, and they weren't doing all kind of stuff. Um, they even had people that were denying that flesh was real. Now, do sometimes I wish I could do something with some of that flesh, but it's real, you know. If you po punch me, I'm probably going to hit you. I would say I'd cry, but I'd probably punch you first, and then I'd cry if you hurt me. Um, flesh is real, but they're saying, no, your flesh isn't real. This world's not real. And, you know, there's a sect, a cult out there today that doesn't believe this world is real, that we are you know, that you fall and you break your arm and you just get up and go on because it isn't real anyway. Your pain's not real. Now, I don't know what we're supposed to do with that pain. My pain's real. Y'all, my pain's real. But anyway, he looks at Christ-like forgiveness. He looks at sins and our forgiveness of sin or Christ-like love and our forgiveness of sins and our assurance of salvation. And I just want to make a play on that word because I'm big into making plays on words. Um, I started this out with John saying, you know, he wants us to be sure. And I thought, wait, wait a minute. Let me, let me change that word. He wants us to have the assurance that we are saved. He wants us to have that assurance. He also wants us to be sure. But he wants to give us, since he's writing to believers, he wants them to be assured of their salvation. Um, they wanted, he wanted them to know who Jesus was, why he came. Um, he wants to enlighten us, and he's, and he's going to do this in this book. So, let's dig in. Have I got one of those screens up there that's going to match that screen? Back? That's pretty good. Okay. we got to remember that these believers are struggling. They are struggling. We all have doubts. But he wants to know that their salvation, wants them to know their salvation is real and that the battle that we go through is worth it. And if you have somebody that says to you, like I've had told to me not long ago, this is too hard. I can't do this anymore. Christianity is just too hard. I can, I'm, going, I'm going back to where I was. Now, I love Jesus, but, and I was going, oh, let's, let, me, let me tell you about that but you just said. You can't do both. But anyway, he comes in. Where'd my screen go? And he, and he says in verse 1, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. And that's where we get our, our first point right here. The, the theme that we have today is that you may know well, that's my first point, too, that you may know Jesus. And he starts in, 
Um, and he says to these people, I know y'all are believers. This is June's rendition of it now. I know you're believers, but let me reintroduce you to Jesus. Many in his audience knew Jesus. I think many or some needed to know that they knew Jesus. And there were some in his audience that didn't know Jesus, and he wanted them to. So he's dealing, and he says, We proclaim to you the one that existed from the beginning. Jesus' existence did not start when he was born as a baby in Bethlehem. His existence did not start when God created the angels before the world was created. Back before the first word, which he said, by the way, it was Jesus, the word. Now, I don't know if that word um, metamorphed into this big bang. I don't care what it did. Jesus spoke it. But before he spoke it, he was here. You know, John 1 says, in the beginning was the word. Y'all can say this with me. I know you know it was, I do. And the word was with God and the word was God. So here we are, the same one, one and the one, one here. We're proclaiming to you. We're not going to like that thing, though. This is all over. Um, the word was God. Now, the word was the word logos. It means Jesus. It's synonymous for Jesus. It also means gospel. They're all in there together. In the beginning was the word. So you can think of the word with two legs walking around. You can think of the word as this book right here. They're both together and they're both, they're both in there. Um, he says in, in the next part, we saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. John says, you want to know who Jesus was? Just listen to me. I'm telling you, he was real. We saw him with our own eyes. We heard him with our own ears. We touched him with our own hands. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that his body was real and that the message he proclaimed was real. He uses three you know when you get old, you let us. He used three verbs of perception. He, I saw, you heard, you touched. Why do he need so many? Look at how history validates Jesus through these three senses. He said, or Jesus Christ was validated to us by his teaching. What we have heard. That's his teaching. John and the other apostles had heard the words of Jesus themselves um, out of his own mouth you know not even second hand out of his own mouth they heard the word of Jesus and what amazing words they were even his enemies over in John seven forty six, even his enemy said never has a man spoken the way that he has now you know when your enemy validates Jesus you know he's pretty validated I think so what right do we have not to believe that they were telling the truth? Anyway, let's go on. Jesus Christ was validated by his life and his miracles. What we have seen, what we have seen with our own eyes. The, the addition of the phrase, with our eyes, shows that, John, that Jesus was not a vision. You know, like these heretics are saying. He was not a vision. Um, he had a body. He wasn't a spirit. So... We don't need a vision. We just looked at him with our own eyes, and they saw. The apostles saw Jesus turn water into wine, feed the 5,000, walk on water, heal the sick, raise the dead. You know, 35 miracles we read about personally in the Gospels. But John also says at the end of his Gospel that, golly, Pete, if we had written down everything that Jesus did, there would not be enough room in this world to put all the books that it, that it would fill. You know, that's how much he did. And we just have those little 35. So Jesus Christ is also validated by his bodily erect, uh, resurrection. What we have touched with our hands. This is the same word that Jesus uses after his resurrection when he appears to the disciples. In Luke, he says, see my hands and my feet that it is I myself, touch me and see. For the Spirit does not have flesh and bones 
that you see that I have. So whether together or apart, and whether it was just the 12 apostles or hundreds more, they all saw the same thing. They were, and they, were, they knew what they saw, and they were willing to die for what they saw. You know, it's hard enough to die for the truth, but I don't know many people that are going to die for a lie. Do you? I think I've heard that somewhere before. That was not a June Dixon, but that was something else. Once we know Jesus, once he's been revealed to us and we experience Jesus, um, then, then it moves into the next step. Uh, verse 2 and 3 say, This one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So if you got that little pencil, the two little things that I would circle in there, the one who is eternal life and fellowship, those, those little words um, will, will come alive to us. He's been around since the beginning. He is eternal life. We don't get to the God. John, John tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man's going to get to God except through me. Um, he later states, we know that the Son of God has come and that he's given us understanding that we may know that he is true and we are in him who is true. We're telling you this so that you may have fellowship with us. Now, John's not referring to a social get-together. Having coffee with a friend is pretty neat. That's fellowship. Better yet, have a piece of pie with it. Is there somebody behind me? Somebody's grinning. Um, but that's not fellowship. John MacArthur equates fellowship with salvation. How does that float your boat? We may have fellowship. We may be saved with him. Um, I, I, just, I just love this. I think John is showing us that the eternal life that we think we're going to have in the future starts now. And that's what comes home when you study some of the books of this Bible, like 1 John. It starts now. What you do now is, we're going to see in a minute, crucial and critical. He, he, it's just critical. But it starts now. And we'll get into that anyway. I wrote down a note to myself. It just kind of hit me in the middle of the night. But if fellowship equates with salvation, then to me that is saying that anybody that goes to hell, there's not going to be any fellowship, which includes having interchange with other people and being of like mind with other people and sharing things in common. Now, I know they wouldn't be the things we're going to share in common, but... Can you imagine a life that you shared with nobody? You know, hell's going to be dog eat dog. There's not going to be any fellowship in hell. And to me, that is just devastating, among other things. But that, that just, that got to me. That just get to me. Okay. I am trying to skip half of my pages because I don't want to be here till 2 o'clock. So somebody may have to stop me because I don't have any idea where there's a clock. So please help me watch my time. Um, before we leave this section, I do want to notice the three words that John uses um, to describe for the, how the apostles communicated their gospel. He says they testified. We testified it. We proclaimed it. We wrote it. All those things. He testified on the basis of eyewitness testimony. Now, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 tells us that facts were established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. He got that straight from the Old Testament, too. Two or three witnesses. Well, we had lots of witnesses that saw Jesus. Lots of witnesses. So when you get on, on a, the stand in a courtroom, you know, I, I tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And I think we used to put your hand on the Bible, and I don't think they do that anymore. I think that's so sad. Anyway, we proclaim, number two, we proclaim as messengers Jesus Christ. We proclaim. Um, 
we're under orders from Jesus because we got our message straight from Jesus' mouth. But we're under orders to give you this message just as he gave it to us. We can't change this message to suit our clientele. It's, it's what it is, and we're going to tell you just exactly like it says. You know, the Gnostics said that, Christ, that um, Christianity was a deep, dark secret and that only a few had that secret. And he says, uh-uh, you can all have it. Um, and then he writes, as we're going to see in the next verse, these things. Through the writings, what do we call those writings that were given to us? That's the New Testament. So through his writings, um, we can enter into the same fellowship that the apostles enjoyed. Um, if John and the other apostles had not proclaimed or written, where would we be today? We couldn't possibly have salvation unless, unless well, I could, we could. God could do something. But he put these apostles on earth to proclaim his word so that we could have salvation too. Um, uh, my point number two is that you may share in the joy of true fellowship. He says, we're writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. He writes these things so that our joy may be made complete, our joy. Um, he's referring to the joy that's, that's found in this apostolic circle with his, his 11 others um, that knew Jesus firsthand. His joy is made complete. How is his joy made complete? He tells us, he gives us a sense in John, 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. He also says in 2 John 4, how happy I was to meet some of your children and to find them living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded. How happy if John's little children could read his letters and not be carried away by the false teachers, but continue in the truth, then John says, I'm a happy camper. He was a happy man. Now, this is where I can't help myself. i got to preach just a little bit. You know, that's one reason mine got redone and redone. I found myself preaching instead of teaching, so I had to start all over again. But I'm going to preach just a little bit right here. Fellowship with God and with one another really are only living out the two great commandments, which are love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what, that's what we're, the whole aim of the Bible is to help us glorify God as we experience this deep joy that comes from a close relationship with one another and from spreading his word. Um, we grow in great joy. And I think I've gotten out of this word that we grow in great joy not only during this lifetime, but we're headed for an eternity of even greater joy that we don't even, we can't even comprehend right now. Um, so work on your relationship with God. This is, this is my sermon here, sermonette. Don't settle for the occasional distant fellowship that really don't mean anything. Don't settle for that cup of coffee that, that you haven't invited God to. Read books that help you know him better. I don't care if that book's just one. Just read. Read to know God better. Um... Work on your relationships with other people. I've discovered real recently that that is so important and so hard to do. I open my mouth and I think good things are coming out, and I discover that they've been turned upside down and backwards, and I go, y'all, I, I, I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean it to be taken the way it did. Well, my church, I hope, knows me by now, and if I really mess with your mind like that, you know, come up to me and grab me and go, did you really say, and, and I'll go, well, I really didn't mean it the way you took it, or I'll say, no, I didn't say that at all. It's amazing to me how you can change a word in a sentence and totally change the meaning and totally, totally alienate another person. Is that not amazing? So work on your relationships with other people. They're important. Um, you know, we're never going to be perfect. We're never going to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect before God. We're not going to be perfect with other people. But we can be better. And, and that payoff is closer fellowship with God, with people, 
salvation, um, we don't get that way without putting forth effort, great effort. This is not easy. Being, being, becoming a Christian may have been easy. They say that you just say the words, you know, I'm not going down that path. But I tell you what, living like one, showing the world to whom you belong, that is not easy. It, it requires great effort. But the payoff is, is that fellowship with God. Now, point number oh, one more word. True Christianity is essentially Jesus Christ. He's revealed in Scripture. He's experienced in life and fellowship, and he's proclaimed with joy. Did y'all see what I just did as a preacher? I went back and just kind of recapped everything. I love it when preachers do that. Um, make sure that what you've got is the real deal. Now I'm going to be through sermonizing for just a minute. Point number three, that you may sh that you may know that God is holy. Now, verses 5 through 10 are going to tell us how to have fellowship with God. Um, he declares it. He proclaims it. He heralds it. He tells us how to have fellowship. Um, like a messenger walking, or like, like TV. Have you ever watched TV and been all engrossed in your show, and all of a sudden, we interrupt this program to bring you a public service amount, you know, something like that. And, and supposedly, if you're a better person than me, you sit up and you take notice because you're getting ready to get some information you didn't have, and it could be very important, so we pay attention to it. Don't go click the TV off. I'm at least curious. That's what he's saying here. Um, what does he announce? God is light. Now, what would you expect him to announce? He says, this is the message we heard from Jesus, and we now declare to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to have fellowship with God. God is light. Okay, John, unpack that for me. I, I kind of got lost in the middle of those words. And he said, okay. Um, three times, this is the third time, depends on which order you read the books in, but he tells us, he gives us a characteristic or a, a facet of God's character. In John 4, 4, he says... God is spirit, or John 4. In 1 John um, 4, he says, God is love. Those are facets of his character. And now in here, he says, God is spirit. And it's referring to his moral character. There is nothing, no blemish, no stain, no anything bad. There's none of that in God. Um, he is absolute holiness and purity. And I don't know, I don't have the words to, to make you understand that those are critical words. You know, that's something your heart's got to wrap itself around. Mine wrapped until I thought I was going to choke myself. And I'm still not sure I've got it wrapped around tight enough. So please, wrap your, wrap your heads around the fact that he is absolutely holy. Darkness, on the other hand, is an apt metaphor for sin. And his character possesses no moral imperfection, no sin. Wrap your head around it. Now, John's statement seems to us very plain. In fact, um, I had one commentator say, well, why mention it? And I thought, ooh, that's pretty good. I thought that myself. That is very obvious, very plain. Um, but it wasn't plain to these people who were struggling. And it really isn't plain to us unless we're really digging trying to get to, to what he's really talking about. Um, John's world, I say John's world. Y'all connected to this world. It was full of idols, um, false gods who, if you've ever read, um, what's that thing back in Greek mythology? You know, everybody studied Greek mythology, even in high school or college. If you've ever read Greek mythology, those gods were sometimes as bad or worse than the people that were worshiping them. They did all kind of scummy stuff. And that's what these people were living in. And sometimes it's easier to look at a God that lets you get by with stuff or that does bad things himself, and, and it's easier. But anyway, we look at today and we say, now what kind of God do unbelievers want? Well, 
just like believers, and I'm going to lump them together, we want a God who's indulgent to our sin, who's blind, who puts up with stuff, who will always reward, who never punishes, um, who hears all kind of excuses. You know, I've heard, I have heard, if there was a God, a good God, then he wouldn't allow bad things to happen. Have you heard that? That's a whole lesson all in itself. So, several times, good gods. We think God's merciful. Yes, he is. God is merciful. He won't be that hard on me. Surely, he doesn't expect me to always be holy and self-denying. Yes, he does. He does. That doesn't mean we're sinless, but we are to strive to be holy. Um, God can't be bribed with, can't be personalized, rationalized, bargained with, bribed. He can't be any of those things. Um, I just, I don't think I've wrapped my head so totally around it yet. And I get into Proverbs. I've just, just a small sidetrack here. Proverbs says over and over, and and, Prover- and uh, Psalms do too, um, that fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Fear of the Lord. And the more I study, and we are taught that the fear of the Lord is deep, deep respect. And I'm thinking to myself this week, June, you need to get a little deeper than that deep respect. Maybe you need to move just a little bit closer to pure, deep fear. You know, if we truly know that God expects us to be holy, that sh- that scares me to death. So anyway... If we, if we start with God's holiness, then we save ourselves from a whole lot of danger of blaming God for, for bad things. When, you know, we want to say, God, why did you let this happen? I didn't deserve this. But when you look at the holiness of God and you know that what that means, then all of a sudden you save yourself all kind of things because we realize that we don't deserve anything but his wrath. So no, I'm not going to say I don't deserve this. I deserve so much more than this that that it isn't funny. It isn't funny. It's also, once we get our head wrapped around God's holiness, we realize that that's the only way that we're going to get to true joy is through God's holiness. It's easy to have false peace if we have a user-friendly God. But I'm here to tell you, you can sit back on that false peace and you can live your life thinking life is just a bed of roses and then we're going to face Jesus one day and those those that false, whatever we were thinking, is going to just get blown up because Jesus isn't going to put up with it. We're going to have to face the consequences of our, of our sin and how we live today. Point number four. We know that we must practice God's truth by walking in the light. Kind of where the rubber hits the road here. We're going to be dealing with, if we're going to understand these last two paragraphs, then we've got to see that John, and this is this is hard for me, so please, I hope, I hope it's hard for you too, and I hope we all get it. We're going, he's writing against the claims, three claims that the false people, the heretics, false prophets, liars, deceivers, antichrist, what they're saying. And he's refuting three things that they say and that they believe. And I think all three of these false claims, Jesus is telling us to be careful. Be careful. Perhaps he's reminding them to be assured of their salvation. Perhaps he's he's personally wanting them to experience God for the first time. But be careful. And when I came from that that point of view early, early this morning, I had to write myself a sticky note. I thought, okay, let's go back through this again and make it make a little bit better sense. Verse 6 says, or the first of the three claims of the heretics, and these are um, if we say, um, claims of the heretics. He says, the first claim is we have fellowship with God. He says in verse 6, so we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but we go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth how many of you thought or how many times have i heard um, once i'm a christian once i'm saved i will live the right way 
because I'm saved. No, we got to practice. Anyway, he says, we're lying. The claim was we have fellowship with God. What's that mean? What's fellowship? What's the synonym for fellowship? Salvation. Keep that in, in your mind. He is saying to the heretics, we, we have changed here. Remember we at the beginning of this book, the we was the apostles, we? Well, now we becomes a very generic group of anybody, everybody. So if we as a group of people, if we as June Dixon, if we as um, a believer, if we say we have fellowship with God and your life does not back up what you're saying, then guess what? You're walking in darkness. Let me read that again. John says their lives did not back up their claim. Therefore, they walked in darkness. They lied, and they weren't practicing the truth. Now, since to walk in the light involves confessing our sins, that's one of the ways we practice, we confess our sins, then walking in darkness means ignoring or denying our sins. We say, mm, I'm going to live my way, you live your way, I'll respect your way, you respect my way, mm, -mm. Um, if we're not living as God tells us to live, we're not confessing our sins. We're doing something really bad wrong. They've been talking the talk, but not walking the walk. I've always wanted to be able to say that. Do we, do we talk the talk or do we walk the talk, the walk? Maybe I don't need to say that. I trip up on it. When our words don't match our life, we're not practicing the truth of what we say we believe. Hence, in essence, we lie. Now, I always got to have something that makes me feel like I've done something real cute so people think this is cute. You know, following the three what ifs or if we say or claims of the heretics, he's got some um, but statements. And I thought, I can't get up there and call them but statements, so I'm going to say rebuttals. These are rebuttals. Verse 7 says, but if we are living in the light... As God is in the light, circle that in in case you didn't see it before, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from sin. To have fellowship with God, we walk in the light as he himself is what? In the light. Y'all, that's so cool. Jesus is already there. So when we join him, Walking inside, walking out our salvation, he's right there beside us. We're not in this by ourselves. And, and I saw that in, I thought, that's the coolest thing I've read all day. That is cool. Um, how does it make you feel knowing he's right there beside you? All of a sudden, I'm not in this journey by myself. Nothing's worse than going through something and you feel like you're going through it by yourself. Nothing's worse. It's a good thing I got my poor old husband. He just troops along right on beside me. Whatever I go through, he goes through too, whether he likes it or he doesn't. But anyway, to walk in the light is to live openly before God, seeking to be holy and hating sin. Ooh, that's deep. It doesn't imply that if you walk in the light, you never sin. Please don't, don't even think that. Um, it points to a habitual habit of walking in the light. Does our lifestyle show that we are trying to walk the way that we should walk, talk the talk that we should talk, think the things that we should think? Um, so how do we walk in the light? If we're in the light, how do we walk the light? How do we practice fellowship? How do we practice that? The scriptures tell you, and I know exactly where you know, you know exactly where this comes from, that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalms 119, 105. Um, the Bible teaches us how to live day by day in a way that pleases God and avoids sin. When I read and I study the Bible, I see through his spirit where I have gone astray. I see where I've gone astray. And what do you do as a Christian? 
You make, you make, allow, you make, what's the word I'm looking for? In other words, you'd quit making excuses. You know, if I try to make a, the proper adjustment to show that I, I picked up on this, Lord. You told me I messed up. I picked up on that. I'm not stupid. Now help me do something about it. That's what's walking in the light. Our ultimate reason for obeying the word of God is love for Christ, right? What does Jesus say back in John? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That was John 14, by the way. If we walk in the light, not only will we have fellowship with one another and with God, but we receive what? What was that word in that, in that verse? Cleansing. We receive cleansing from God. Now, the criminal justice system in this country, does it not point out, remind us that people are sinners? Mm-hmm. People are sinners. So cleansing in verse 7, he's talking about a continual cleansing. Yes, we were cleansed from our sins when Christ died on the, on the cross. That's called justification. Or as part of justification. Here he's talking about progressive sanctification. That's a word Christians ought to know. Sanctification. Growing. Ever growing. Every day. As he cleanses us from our sins. As we learn from what we've done wrong. He cleanses us. He cleanses us and he takes. He not only takes the sin away. He takes the guilt away too. It's gone. We remember it. I'm sorry we remember it. Um, he puts it behind him. He chooses not to remember it anymore. I'm not that good. Um, but anyway, in verse 8, it says, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves. That's the second claim of a heretic. We have no sin. This again, I had to go back and say, now, he's speaking to the believers, but he's telling the believers, if you like a heretic, a heretic is going to say, we have no sin. Don't be like that. That's what he's saying. He's not calling them all heretics. He's saying, don't believe them. Um, they may have been claiming that they've achieved, achieved a state of sinless perfection. I remember reading stuff back when I had to read this kind of stuff. That was deep. Achieving a state of sinless perfection. Because I knew I was never going to get there. And they said, you're just seeing my body. I think this was Gnost Gnost part of Gnosticism too. You're just seeing my body. My body's not even real. The real part of me is my spirit. And my spirit is good. And there's no sin in it. Mm, we have no sin. Either way, however they believed, whether they'd gotten better, whether they'd gotten past it, whether they weren't real in the first place, sin didn't matter. It didn't matter to them. And he says... If we say, like them, that we have no sin, then he says, you are self-deceived. You did it to yourself. You are self-deceived. Um, can you imagine going into a doctor, a cancer doctor, since at our age, that's the one that comes, pops to my mind all the time, and he says, June, I hate to tell you this, you got two weeks to live. And June thinks about it a minute. She turns around and says, Doc, you're crazy. I don't believe that for a minute. I don't know who got to you. How many of us would do that? The only thing worse than, than denying that sin or hiding that sin from God is that little old ostrich out there in the wild. How many people have seen an ostrich? You know, those all long necks, what do they do? When they see a predator coming, they go bury their heads in the sand. Just like a little kid. Oops, pardon me. And he goes, buries that head in the sand. He says, ooh, I can't see you, so you can't see me. 30 seconds later, he's a meal for somebody, isn't he? But that's, you know, that's just as bad as what we do. We can't do that. Um, we're deceivers. We've done it to ourselves. We've led ourselves astray. Mm. And the other thing is, the truth isn't in us. This refers to the gospel. This is tough, y'all, but this is what he says. The truth is not in us. What does John mean? 
If a Christian says, if a Christian says he no longer has the capacity to sin, then he is self-deceived and the truth that he can indeed sin as a Christian is not in him. We still have a sin nature. The bottom line is the Christian who thinks he's no longer capable of sinning is self-deceived and not living according to the truth of the gospel. But remember, he is talking to believers and he's saying, don't believe like they do. He's not telling them that they believe this way. He's cautioning them against, don't ever say, you have no sin. Don't ever. Okay, the third claim of the heretic. This is a worse one. I have not sinned. Did he do that for me? 1051. I'm doing good. I have not sinned. Verse 10 says, we claim we have not sinned. If we do, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. John is addressing the concept of individual sins. You know, it's human nature to deny our sin, isn't it? That's just human nature. We justify it. We sweep it under the carpet. We pretend like we didn't do it. Um, we, we explain our way out of it, whatever way. We don't want to face that reality. This is the most blatant of the three, and you see that with his consequence here. We make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This will take you to your knees. It goes further than the other claims by saying we've not sinned in the past, and we're not sinning now. Perhaps they were claiming that their enlightenment had led them to see that they were basically good people, especially if they were just spirits. Spirits good, bodies bad, don't have a body, so it doesn't matter. Um, John would say, the man walking in darkness is deceiving himself and anyone who believes him. Worse, he's calling God a liar. We need to apply this personally. As a way of life, which we are not, but here again, he's warning us. Uh, as a way of life, if I am not allowing God's word to confront my awful thoughts, attitudes, motives, words, and deeds then I'm walking in darkness. If I dodge my sin by blaming others or making up excuses for why I sin, I am walking in darkness. And to John, to walk in darkness is not describing a carnal Christian. It's describing an unbeliever. An unbeliever, no matter how much we claim to have fellowship with God. To have fellowship with God, we must recognize that he is absolutely holy. And we must not walk in the darkness. A person walking in the light does not deny his sin or try to cover it up. He does not blame others for it or make excuses about it. Rather, he confesses it. And what is confession? What do we do when we confess our sin? We agree that God's right, right? Confession comes with um, asking for forgiveness while part of confession. To confess means to agree that our sin is sin. It means to accept responsibility, turn from it. And God's wonderful promise that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us, to take it away from our guilt. Now, I have to conclude with a story. I think it's a true story. It, was, it came across to me as a true story, but you have to make up your own minds about the story. In the 18th century, an abbot was disciplining two monks for some infraction of the rules. He imposed on them the rule of silence. They could not talk to one another. That would be punishment. They tried to figure out some way to fill the long hours. Finally, one of them gathered 28 flat stones from the courtyard. Putting different numbers on them, he devised a new game. By using gestures, the men agreed on certain rules, but the most difficult part was keeping silent when one of them scored a victory. But then they remembered that they were allowed to say aloud the prayer, Dixit Dominus Domino Mayo, 
By using the one word of this Latin expression that means Lord, the winner was able to signal his triumph by yelling, Domino! Guess what? The monks gave the impression that they were praying, but really they were playing. Thus the game of dominoes was born. Now you can take that as a real story or... I thought it was kind of cute. It's easy to put on a religious veneer by claiming that you have fellowship with God when really you're walking in darkness and you're deceiving yourself. John doesn't want us to play spiritual dominoes. He wants us to experience genuine fellowship with the holy God by walking in the light as he himself is in the light. Thank you. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for standing up here with me, for taking the fear away, for, Lord, just helping me understand through my own study that walking in your light is the most important thing that I could do with my life. Lord, help me to to gather what you're saying, take it deep in my soul, translate it the way that it needs to be translated, and let it come out in my life, showing that I have changed Help me grow ever closer to you. I want that personal sanctification. I want to be a little bit better today than I was yesterday. I want my life to show itself belonging to you because I want to bring you glory with every fiber of my being. Walk with us, each one, Lord. Protect us, keep us safe until we meet again next week. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen.